All right, so before you create your next ASP.NET Core application, I want you to stop and do this one thing. And of course, that's figuring out how you're going to implement a plugin architecture into your next project. In my recent videos, I've been talking about how we can load plugins into an ASP.NET Core Blazor application and actually change some of the UI elements based on plugins. Now, I've actually got this request on a couple of different platforms, and that's how we can do dynamic plugin loading instead of just loading plugins on startup. So I recently published an article on this and we're going to go through the same concepts in this video but we're going to cover the basics of how we can do dynamic plugin loading and what sorts of things we might want to consider of course when we start to explore things like this we're going to have to think about how our plugins work with our core application or if we have plugins that load other plugins how the plugin itself will work with its parent. So yes, I'll explain how this all works, but you might finish this video with more questions than when you started. So with that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio, start looking at some of the code for this, and then discussing what implications we should be considering. All right, so in true plugin fashion, I'm going to illustrate how we can make the necessary changes to our example application from the previous video. And if you haven't seen that, I'll make sure to link it above so you can go watch that and come right back here before we continue. So in the last video, we actually looked at making all the examples as plugins themselves. And that way I can go ahead and modify things in isolation. And just to prove it, all three files that I had to touch to make this change are only located at the top here in Visual Studio, as you can see. So those are the only three things I had to go do. And we were able to get dynamic plugin loading for one of the types of plugins that we're interested in. So the concept here that I want to go over is that we had this idea of a plugin provider. And in the previous videos, I talked about how we had this super simple generic plugin provider that just took a type parameter of the type of plugin you wanted to work with. Now, this was really simple in the fact that we just had AutoFAC injecting our different plugins that were registered of that type. And then from there, it just returned the list of plugins on this get plugins method. So very simple in terms of how it's implemented. It didn't do anything intelligent. Really, all of the intelligence came from AutoFAC passing in the plugin instances. But in order to make it so that we can dynamically load plugins at runtime, what we're going to be doing is looking at something called a file system watcher. Now, a file system watcher is not unique to plugins or anything like that. There are tons of different use cases for it, but we're going to look at using a file system watcher in order to discover plugins. And this is the first part where I want to pause and get you to think about what you might want to do in your own application. So the example that we walk through is only going to be discovering plugins as they're added into a directory. So that's what this part is right here. And we're going to be filtering on any DLL that gets added that has plugin somewhere in the name and then a DLL extension. And the other important thing to mention is that I said it's when it's created. So this will watch for a new file to be created. And that actually means that if you go ahead and delete that plugin, we're not actually going to remove it in this example. So if you want to have some type of functionality where you can add new plugins at runtime and then remove them as well, you're going to want to consider how you might want to change the example we're about to walk through. And the other part is that if you're thinking about how your plugins are stored or where they're stored, you may want to consider how this watcher works. So for me, because they're just dropped into the bin directory where we're running from, I can keep it pretty simple. And it's a pretty basic example because I'm just looking for anything with plugin in the name, but you might want to have a plugin folder or different plugin folders. Maybe you have a different naming convention or some other filter that you need to run when you're looking for plugin DLLs. All of that is going to be an exercise for you in your application. But this code right here that I have from lines 20 to 24 is what we're going to use in our current example just to get the basics going. If you're not familiar with events and event handlers in C-sharp, line 24 actually shows us hooking up an event handler to an event called created. And you can see that on line 23, we have enable raising events on this file system watcher. So what that's going to let us do is that when we do have the file system watcher pick up a new file, this enable raising events actually allows the created event on the watcher to get fired. And when that happens, we're going to call this method watcher created, which is what I've actually created down below. And we'll go to that in just a moment. But this event handler is hooked up to the created event. If we look at the signature, this is pretty standard for an event handler where we have an object 
that's called sender as the first argument, and then some event arguments. And you can have customized event arguments. So we do get file system event args that are passed in as the type. And then the code that I have down below is actually borrowed from other parts in our example application. I've just copied and pasted them into here to do what we actually require to load plugins. And you'll see that I left some comments. Your eyes are probably drawn to that. And I'll talk about those in just a moment. But how this is going to work is that we create a container builder because I'm using Autofact for this. And then I'm going to load the assembly from the path that's on the event args. So when that file system watcher fires, these event args are going to have the full path to the DLL that was added to the directory that met the filter, which was plugins somewhere in the name and then dot DLL at the end. Next, this code here is what we actually use to go look for all of the types that are inside of an assembly, which we just created, and these conditions that we have here are the type of T plugin API. And if you recall, this is a generic class, so it's just the type parameter on the class. And we need to make sure that the type we're looking at is of this type. The other two parameters that we had here, I mentioned in the other videos, but this is just so that we don't try to register abstract classes because they're not going to resolve properly and we don't want to have interfaces. So it does need to be a class. But this code that we have here is what we use with Autofact to go dynamically register all of the plugin types in an assembly. Next, what we're going to do is on line 56, actually build that dependency container. So we get an Autofact container and then we begin a lifetime scope and from there, we're able to, on line 58, actually resolve all of the types of plugins that we had in that DLL. And from there, we're just going to add the range of plugins into this collection that's underscore plugins. All right, so let's look at some of these comments because you probably have some questions as you were scanning through. The first part here says, can we provide dependencies from the core application? And to get you understanding what this actually means, we're creating a new container builder here. So after this line 41 has finished running, this container builder doesn't have any dependencies registered to it. That means anything from our core application isn't actually able to be provided into this plugin. For your use case, you may actually want that to be how things work. It will mean that the plugin is isolated from being able to resolve dependencies in the core application or some parent plugin, but that also might mean that you're not able to share things that are registered into the core application or the parent plugin into these other plugins. So to give you an example of what I mean, maybe in your core application, you have a logger that gets registered. And that way in Autofac, anyone that wants a logger can go resolve it. If we leave line 41 the way it is currently, that would mean that the plugins that get discovered dynamically actually never have the opportunity to resolve that logger. And that's because this container builder never gets the dependencies that are in the core application. Now, I'm not illustrating it in this video, but if you wanted to work around that, if you had a lifetime scope reference from the core application or the parent plugin, so you see on line 57 here, something like this, if you had that scope from the core app or the parent plugin, you could actually build another container builder from that scope. And that would mean that you can create a child container builder. And from there, that container builder will have all of the dependencies from the original. So that logger example, I just kind of walked through that would allow you to solve for that problem. But again, you need to be thinking about how you want your plugins to interact because that's a decision you need to make for your own application. The next part that I wanted to call out is this comment that's on from line 53 to line 55. And it says, how do we want to handle the lifetime here? So that's with reference to this lifetime scope. If we call dispose too early, any delayed service resolution will blow up. So these are actually disposable. So if I put a using in front, this actually does compile. And what will happen is if I leave it like this, when we leave the method, the container and the scope will actually be disposed. Now on the surface, if you're looking at this, if we resolve the plugins, we actually don't need to keep the scope alive anymore if everything the plugin needed was resolved right at this point. However, there's ways in Autofact that you can lazily resolve things because if that type has not yet been required from anything loaded right at this point, so after line 58 executes, if there's some other type that later needs to be resolved, this scope and container might already be disposed of if we leave it like this. And if that's the case, that resolution will blow up later in the application. 
So if you did want to constrain in your own application that you have your plugins getting resolved and that lifetime scope is not allowed to exist after, you could absolutely put a using like this. If you wanted to make sure that you could do removing of plugins, for example, that would mean that the plugin does not exist for the full lifetime of the application. And that would mean that you probably want to find a way to dispose of the scope in the container later if that plugin's removed. In our example that we're looking at, we're only ever adding plugins. So that's why I left the code just like this, where there were no using statements or disposes called. And to reiterate, that's because when this thing discovers a plugin and then resolves it, I actually want that plugin to exist for the whole lifetime of the application. So the only way that that's going to get cleaned up is if we end up terminating the app. At that point, everything is going to be disposed and cleaned up of anyway. So these are all things that you need to be thinking of. And unfortunately, in this video, I don't want to overcomplicate it by trying to illustrate all of these things in one video, but that's some homework for you to think through and potentially some follow-up videos that I can try to address some of these other patterns. All right, so up to this point, we've created a file system watcher that can go load an assembly, register all the plugin types with Autofac, and then go resolve those plugin instances, adding them to a collection. The API for this class actually just required us to give an iRead-only list back of the plugins. And what we're doing is wrapping a generic plugin provider. So that way, if you had plugins loaded at startup because they were already there, you would get that list. And then we're going to combine that list with our underscore plugins instance variable. And underscore plugins is only the plugins that are loaded from the file system watcher. So to summarize, by the time we leave this method, we've combined the list of everything loaded at startup plus everything after. Now that's going to wrap it up for this class, but we have to think about how we're going to use this now. In essence, this class is what's going to provide us with the dynamic loading that we want but we have to go figure out the right spots to hook it up. The first most obvious spot is going to be in the actual Autofac module. We still need this generic plugin provider, and in this plugin type, so the, the demo of plugins that we're looking at was iHTML fragment plugin. So iHTML fragment plugin, we still need a generic plugin provider. And if you don't believe me, if I go back over here, that's what's going to end up getting passed into here. And yes, this is a generic type argument. So if I go back to the plugin module, you can see that I'm using the same type. So that's going to mean that this right here that I'm highlighting on line 13 is the type that we need to be passed in to this class, late loading plugin provider with this type parameter. So by having this part here with Autofac, we'll actually be able to instantiate this one because we'll be able to resolve this dependency from the container automatically. So this was the second change that we needed to make to actually have this available, but we're not using that anywhere. At this point, if we just register it, nothing's actually consuming it. In fact, the original code is still just using this. So we have to go look at where this generic plugin provider was used in this plugin itself. So that's actually used on the Razor page. So I'm jumping over to that. On line five, you can see that I've changed this plugin provider. Instead of being the generic plugin provider, it's actually requiring that we have a late load plugin provider instead. And the best part is because we used an interface and it has the exact same API, I didn't have to change literally anything else on this page. Now, I know this is a really simple API, so I got pretty lucky here, but that's just a nice little touch. So I'm going to go ahead and run this, and then we're going to see what it looks like when the plugin's not there. I'm going to drop the files in, and we'll see how it ends up getting dynamically loaded. All right, with our application running, if we jump over to HTML fragments, which is the one plugin type we have, we actually don't have any plugins. And that's because I haven't put any in the directory. So if you recall, that plugin provider that we created should on startup load anything that's there. This implies currently there are no DLLs meeting that plugin type. And then the second part, what we're going to demonstrate is that we would add in what the file system watcher picked up. So I'm going to go ahead and drop those files in and we'll see what happened. And all right, they are dropped in. But wait, why didn't anything change? And of course, that's just because of how we implemented things. So what we were able to do was actually tell the plugin provider 
to go load those plugins because the file system watcher triggered, but our Blazor app does not know that it needs to refresh. So this brings us to yet another point that you want to consider for your application, and that's what type of user experience do you expect in your application when a plugin's dropped in? I could have designed it such that when you drop the plugin in, the page refreshes, or one of the components refreshes. And in fact, that might be a really cool example to follow up with, but Right now, nothing actually changed on the screen. That doesn't mean that nothing happened in the application, it's just that there was no disruption to the user experience. So if I were to go ahead and click on Home, and then I go back to HTML Fragments, you can see that it says there are one plugins now, and yes, this is the third or fourth video now. I have not changed this to say plugin with S in parentheses. Like I said, probably never changing it, but you can see that we loaded in this new plugin. And I didn't edit the video or anything to cut it out or jump, but you saw me navigate to home and come back, and it was right there. So that should demonstrate that we did dynamically load the plugin, and that's because that file system watcher was able to get the event, let our event handler handle it, we loaded the assembly, pulled in the plugin types, and then added those to a collection. And the only way that we were able to get the UI to refresh was going to home. And then when we click back on HTML fragments and it renders this page, it actually had to go re-trigger to go ask for all of the plugins. In your application, that might be a totally acceptable user experience where you don't want to disrupt anything. But in other cases, you may want to actually consider dynamically changing the content on the screen. That would have made for a way more interesting demo. I totally get it. But I did want to actually be able to bring up these points to get you thinking. All right, that's going to wrap up dynamic plugin loading in Blazor. If you haven't read my article on it, I'll link that in the description. So you can go ahead and check that out as well. You might find that reading through it is a little bit easier to understand. You can take your time. There's also some code that you can copy directly out. This should be what we talked about. It actually highlights that case where you have a scope from your parent application. It just doesn't give you the code that's going to show you how to get that scope. Because again, that's probably a good exercise for you to figure out and how that should look in your own app. If you want to be able to provide plugins with dependencies from your parent application. So as you can see, there's a ton that we can explore with plugins inside of ASP.NET Core and Blazor or any other type of application you're building. I should do a follow-up video where we dynamically change the screen when the plugins are dropped in. So I'll try to give that a shot, but hopefully for now that gets the gears turning in your head and you can think about how you want to implement your plugins. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.